Hello everyone, this is Mr. DJ John, aka John LaPere here on site in Edwardsville, Illinois with, with a very talented um, musician here, Chad Nathini, aka Emperor X. Hello! So, you just played two sets tonight, how do you feel? Well, you can see this, I'm a little, a little sweaty. <laughs> yeah, set one was, was old stuff, set two was new stuff, and we're, this is the studio that we're recording it in. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it stressful, but it's, it takes energy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, especially whenever some random guy's asking for all the deep cuts <laughs> from the... Well, that was actually very energizing. Cool. When you have people, you know, it, it's weirder if, like, people are shy, because mm -hmm. then you don't really know what people are looking for. You have to, it takes a lot of listening. Yeah. It takes less energy when people tell you explicitly what they want, so that was very nice, actually. Well, that's great. I mean, all your stuff is great. So, Thanks. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, let's talk about how... Oh, I might have to edit some of this stuff later. Edit it away. But, Here, uh, here's some uh, thinking music. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's making it better or worse. But, um, <laughs> so you come from a kind of interesting background where you were a science teacher at one point. Mm -hmm. You were here in the United States and probably toured most, if not all, of the continental United States. If not, There are a couple of states missing, okay. but about 45 of them for sure. And you, you're now in, I guess, Berlin and Germany? Correct. And doing, this is the exclusive USA stop before you go back to Europe and do your... Yeah, stuff. I mean, I came over here just to record. Yeah. So um, I was going to play some dates around it as well, but it was... Not very uh, quickly. I, I I didn't plan it ahead of time enough. I wanted to get this record done. Yeah. So I booked the studio time with my friend Ryan, and um, yeah, that was the priority. Mm -hmm. So this being, there were people that came from really far. <laughs> like that that blew my mind. Somebody came from a six-hour drive or something. Yeah. If she was the second person, we came here, and then she saw us, and she's like, "Oh, is this the right place?" I'm like. I think so. And yeah, it has that vibe, right? Yeah. Like, it, are we, are, is this fine? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a diner downstairs. Yeah. There's, like, a lawyer next door. Mm -hmm. You don't quite know. So you're talking, so we played, you played both some of your older music and some of your new music that mm -hmm. you released. How would you describe your music to someone who's never heard your music before? Depends on the person. Um, if, uh, like, I, first I try and figure out what kind of music they listen to. Okay. And they find well, an access point. So, if, for example, if it's my grandma, mm -hmm. I would say, like, uh, it sounds like John Denver, but if it's if it's you, I would say, um, I would say like, <clears throat> I don't know, Nick Drake with more pop sensibility, or like Arthur Russell or something. Like Arthur Russell is definitely my entry point when I talk to people. Mm -hmm. Like if they like Arthur Russell's music, I feel like I can show them my music and it'll be all right. Mm -hmm. You know. So would you kind of kind of have those guys as your influences when it comes to your music? Yeah, but I mean. Um, I don't ha I don't have any overt ones. Okay. Uh, not I mean like God, there's so much on the new record, especially. My influence is heavily Billy Joel right now, <laughs> like um, like the Stranger era Billy Joel. Okay. Um, and a lot of Steely Dan and Randy Newman. I've been listening to a ton of them lately. Um, and for the electronic stuff, Tierra Whack. Okay. You know this artist? Um, I don't think so. No. Yeah, you you need to check out that Tierra Whack. That's okay. good. Um. But, yeah, recently it's mainly been, like, piano-y singer-songwriters, just because it's so devastating to have all of these instead of just, like, you know, the guitar. Yeah. It's kind of seductive. Well, you played, you played your old tunes pretty well, whatever you had. Thanks. Because it, it's, um... And I, that, that was no, that was no BS. Like, I really didn't, I hadn't played those songs on piano before. Yeah. If I had, it's been, like, six years or something. So yeah, I was I was on the fly there for a lot of it. I was like, okay, I think I know this key. I think I'll play with that. Yeah. So um, so you got you're playing, you you recorded here, and you kind of had an impromptu session with thirty plus other people. Yep. Um, so you're going back to Europe, and you're playing some more shows over there. I got a show in Belgium on Saturday. Uh, oh yeah, this Saturday I'm playing in Belgium, mm -hmm. um, and then I've got. Just in Europe, you play festival dates, right? So, like, you just go on the weekend, and it's, like, some random small town, and it's a castle at the top of a hill, and 
you know, a bunch of Germans that are like, they don't even necessarily know your music or like they're not that stoked about it, but your name is in like this Rolodex of booking-y people. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes, this would be nice. I think we'll listen to some music from this person. And then I get there and, you know, kind of weird them out a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it's glass. Is that kind of, is that, is that maybe the major difference that you kind of feel performing, yeah. say, in Europe compared to the United States? Or is there other differences that there are a ton? Um, I think German audiences are more um, when you get them before 10 p.m. They're more open-minded. Mm -hmm. When you get them after 10 p.m., they're insufferable. Um, very difficult to control. Okay. Like a, 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 a drunk German audience is very difficult. Um, but every country is very different in Europe. Yeah. Like Germany has its own thing. Mm -hmm. France has its very much its own thing. Italy has very much its own thing. Example in Italy. Quite often, when you're doing like punk type tours, you play these things called Archie, mm -hmm. A R C I. I forget what it stands for, but it's like this. It's like communist DIY punk house McDonald's. Oh wow! And it's like every. And I don't mean like they serve food. I mean it's a chain oh. called Archie, and every town has one, and that's where the punk shows are. Wow! So like you show up and you're like, oh, I know what I'm gonna get at this Archie. It's gonna be like dinner and Italians being stoked about things. And Germany's not like that at all. It's very different. France, it's very different. The UK is very, very different. Mm -hmm. So there's really, it's really difficult to say any one particular European difference. Yeah, trait. Yeah. But uh, Germany, for sure, I think they tend to be more quiet. And if people are like, hmm, that was good. Like that's a very good response. Okay. In America, they'd be like, ooh, they're not enthusiastic enough. Yeah. You know. Do you kind of see a difference between the, where? Is there a difference, I guess, trying to corral people to get closer, as you call Fugazi style? Yeah, or? nah, I, I, I just, you just have to do it. Yeah. I don't, I mean, yes, there's a difference, but at, ultimately, at the end of the day, you need to be forceful mm -hmm. uh, to make it happen, usually, and it just, it's just a matter of, like, are you willing to do that? And there are some audiences where I'm just like, like, for example, a show I played recently in Germany, it was just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I just went into full-on anarcho mode. Like, if it doesn't work... I do a noise set. Okay. But, like, not not out of spite, but I think it's what those people want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, the people who come, like, for example, if you came and you dr drove very far, mm -hmm. nobody was nobody was paying attention, but you were here, the best way to give someone like you a show is to, uh, not to, like, struggle to play quietly and so that you wouldn't hear it, but to just go for it, you know, and do something. And I think you would walk away then with some kind of experience you'd be able to talk about. That happened. I saw Ariel Pink in okay. uh, ages ago, like way before people knew who he was. Um, well, in the early stages of that, in Lawrence, Kansas. There were like four people there. And it was the scariest show I've ever seen. Like these guys were clearly on one. And um, I don't know if, if it was drugs or whatever, but they just felt, they seemed like they were, they were like just doing it owning a noise set in a bar with four people and I, that influenced me so much I really admired that and I uh, when I need to do that I do it so, but that said in a room like this like there was one point where there were like, a couple people just a little bit talking in the back mm -hmm. if you don't squelch that really fast it gets out of control yeah. my go to for this is another person I've been listening to a lot lately is Nina Simone okay. um, who has a song called Stars and I have a song on my new record called Stars as well it's direct reference so she starts to play it and it even starts, she, it, my song starts, um, stars, and hers, uh, it's like, stars, they come fast, they come slow, na, na, na. It's, it's a Janice Dean song, but, but it's a very similar intro and everything, stars, it's mine, and, um, in the recording of her doing this live at Montreux, in Switzerland, there's a, in 1970 something rather, she starts to play, stars, they come fast, they come slow. They come fast. Sit down! Sit down! And like the audience laughs at first, and like like I'm doing almost exactly how she does it. I look like a freak when I do it right now, but you should see her video. She looks insane. And I really, really admire that. And then the girl sits down, and she says, Stars. And then everyone's just transfixed. Yeah. Really beautiful moment. And it, I don't think it has to be confrontational. But I think it's the artist's responsibility to address things like that. Yeah. You feel you're the show. Yeah, I'm, and like no one's gonna do it for you. Yeah, you know, I mean unless you're like, oh, so for example, like, you, do you know Mark Kozlik, Sun Kill Moon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, like, I think when he plays a show, he would just, like, walk off the stage or something like that mm -hmm. happened. He'd be like, you idiot. I'm, you're just dumb. I'm going to take my money and go. Like, I don't know. If I were making, like, 5000 bucks a show, I'd probably have a similar attitude, maybe. But I don't think so. I don't think I'm a very different approach than that. I think he just wants things perfect or he's not going to do it. I think that happens for a lot of artists. Um, yeah, and I think that's a real benefit of not having... Not, uh, of having had a pretty hard road as artists have, you know? Like, I, I, I had to work really hard to get where I am, and, um, yeah, I don't think Mark Kozlik would put up with some of the things I've had to put up with, but having put up with them gives me that, yeah, you need to, like, stop and be like, hmm, I'm gonna stop talking? Good. <laughs> Especially, I guess, you know, in Europe, when there is a language barrier or something like that. Yeah, well, my German is hilarious, though. It's, like, um, it's bad German, yeah. but it's fluent bad German. Um, so, like, did you ever have that math teacher in high school who's, like, very brilliant, but a recent immigrant, and maybe their English wasn't perfect? Oh. You know, this kind of maybe archetype? Maybe once I went, once I had a bunch or of TAs and graduates. Yeah, 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 that would be, that's what I'm like, mm -hmm. like, when I speak German. So, like, imagine that guy on the stage and saying, like, why is you not quiet? Like, that's what I sound like yeah. to the Germans when I say my German thoughts. So, it, yeah, that does add a little bit to it. But honestly, it makes it easier yeah. because it's like, oh, look at the weird foreign guy. Yeah. So when you perform live, do you, how do you feel about, I guess, and, I, and this is kind of something I find interesting asking different people their thoughts about, how do you feel like performing live versus from recording in the studio? Are you trying... Because I know some artists are like, you know, I made it in the studio as perfect as it can be. Mm -hmm. Performing it live is just going to, you know, there's something about it that I'm not going to like about it. You know, you know, maybe some people have the luxury of not, you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. Versus, you know, oh, I perform live, it's kind of, you know, I'm sometimes I make mistakes or something like that. But that's kind of the fun part of it. If I'm working with another band, maybe I have to rearrange certain things that, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, originally maybe they didn't play enough originally because some people play certain instruments they don't play all the instruments that they originally recorded with. Is there something, what do you think of how maybe that kind of dichotomy? I go back to, like, really basic, you know, freshman year philosophy 101 concept of form, mm -hmm. like like the platonic form, the two-ness of two, for example. There is no, like, like, there's something to, yeah. right? Like, there are two books, and there are two couches, and there are two eyes, but, like, two is a fundamental thing. So, like, in, in aesthetic theory, this also, um, I can't cite a source right now, but I have this n notion in my head that a song is a platonic form, um, a composition is a platonic form, and that performances are instances of that form, and so are recordings. I don't see them as different. I see them as different in kind, of course, because you can do things on a recording that you can't do in performance and vice versa, but I don't see any recording as canonical of my own work like I've released multiple versions of songs several times there's mm -hmm. a record called 19 live recordings I, I think some I of the versions some of the versions on that are superior to the recorded versions and I and you know like I don't think there's anything canonical about my recorded versions I think some artists there that's probably the case mm -hmm. like you know techno artists the instance is the platonic form yeah because it doesn't exist in any other way you know um but I'm definitely in between there. And I think most rock music is. Uh, but I'm very aware of this notion of uh, it not being repeatable. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like, the most boring thing in the world is to go to a show and have the band sound exactly like they do on the record. Mm -hmm. I hate that. Yeah. I, 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 think it's, I think it's one of the really underrated things about live recording. Mm -hmm. It's something different. Yeah, because I recently listened to... Um, it was My Bloody Valentine. They had like a recording in Canada or something, but they had mm -hmm. they had you made me realize my girlfriend hates the song. Mm -hmm. But it goes like it goes seventeen minutes. It's a pretty harsh song, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it goes like fourteen <laughs> minutes of just noise. And I, for some reason, I, I'm working in the office, so I find the most you know I get to con I concentrate whenever that comes on. And I think it's one of the best things ever. That's but, cool. But, you know. Um, I think with noise bands, it's definitely also something where performance. It's like jazz, right? Mm -hmm. Like the performance is very much the thing yeah uh and it's i think what we're looking at is like a difference of musical ontology a shift between like classical versus jazz versus rock music mm -hmm. um there's a great book by a guy named Grasic. i forget his i think theodore Grasic, 
called Rhythm and Noise that addresses specifically this concept, and that was very influential to me. There's also a philosopher named uh, Levison out of uh, some school in Baltimore who dances around these ideas too. But I, I studied a little bit of music philosophy back in the day. It's been years. But it deeply influenced me, obviously. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Uh, you, you're touring in Europe. If any of the listeners are going if, to... Off and on, not that much. Well, if you're but, anyone's in Europe, look out for infrared. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, but also here, like, yeah. I, I tour in the States at, on an act... This year's very different because um, I've been teaching a lot this year. Okay. Um, I really hit teaching hard because I was, I was a high school teacher for a while, and then I did art for a long time, and I, I was literally having dreams about teaching. Yeah. Like, I don't mean I dreamed of it, I mean I was like waking up after having dreamt that I was teaching again. And uh, an opportunity came along and I jumped at it. Okay. Um, but I'm teaching songwriting and music production stuff now. Cool. At a, at a uni in Berlin. So um, I had to scale back touring for a couple months for that. Mm -hmm. And also I had to come out with a record. Yeah. But once this one comes out, it'll probably come out in, I don't know, early 2020. There'll be a lot of touring around that. I usually tour like 60 dates in America a year. Cool. Um, and then 30 in Europe. Cool. So I'll be around. Oh, that's good. And maybe in Missouri as well. Yep. Well, if you're in Rollo, we'll let people know. Cool. Right on. And come in and do a set on the air or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that would be excellent. Do you do stuff like that? Yeah. Um, we had, so one of the big things in Rollo that goes on is they have what's St. Patrick's. Mm -hmm. And so we always have, I think last year they had, um, they had some, some artists either, they had some talk over the radio, and I think in the past they had some cool. perform. So it's always really fun when that happens. Yeah, just let me know uh, when I when I post my dates. Ping me. Okay, let's cool. set it up. Okay, cool. Um, if people want to follow you, or do you have any at emperorworks? Okay. Emperorworks.net and e m p e r o wait e m p e r o r x dot net emperorx dot net and at emperorx Twitter, at emperorx Instagram, all that stuff. But I'm extremely hostile uh, to social media stuff right now, so I hesitate. But it, I'm on there, so. If anyone else wants to be, wants to join me in the uh, terrified alienation hell void of platform social media, that's where I am. Okay. Well, with that out of the way, um, any goals for the uh, later part of the year? Anything? Um, finish this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've got a bunch of writing to do, like text writing that yeah. I'm trying to catch up on. And, um, yeah, get ready for a tour next year. I'm really stoked about these new songs, and uh, I, hope, I hope the response will be what I'm, what I'm dreaming of. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning yeah, in. Yeah, man. And thank you very much for the interview. So. Bye, Rolla. So this See is you later. KMNR 89.7. Do you know that, is there, a, is there a theme song for the station? Uh, no, you can make one. What is it? What's it, it? It's KM, KMNR. KMNR, like the hat? Yeah. And what's the station? 89.7. KMNR. KMNR.